2007 was a perfect year for films. We were graced with the first Transformers film in the series, which is still the best one. Spider-Man 3 showed us that Tobey Maguire has some of the best moves in town. Judd Apatow provided us with great summer laughs in both Knocked Up and Super Bad. Bruce Willis as John McClane returned in Live Free or Die Hard, and a little rat warmed our hearts by serving us a dish of perfection in Ratatouille. And while all of that's perfect, I'd say that I had my hopes the highest for one movie in particular, and that movie is 28 Weeks Later. Now, you may be thinking, of all of the films, that's the one you were most excited for? And yes. Well, let me explain. Back in 2002, Danny Boyle unleashed his film 28 Days Later. It became a massive success and redefined zombie and horror films without any actual zombies in it. Because this film was so popular, a sequel was inevitable. In 2005, when Danny announced the sequel was happening, I could barely control my excitement. Let's take a look back at one of my favorite horror films that come out of the 2000s in this episode of Revisited. Nice hearing from you, Carlos! Danny Boyle, writer Alex Garland, and producer Andrew McDonald were praised for their film 28 Days Later. Danny Boyle was also back in the good graces of the public after his two previous misfires, A Life Less Ordinary and The Beach. Both were distributed through 20th Century Fox, whereas 28 Days Later was dispersed through Fox Searchlight Pictures. Andrew McDonald commented that they were taken back by the reaction and success to the film and sought out to make another one. They thought it would be a great idea to try and please audiences one more time. No one told me that we're now admitting children. After 28 Days Later was released, the first pitch for a sequel was set to be titled 29 Days Later. It would bring back Killian Murphy and Naomi Harris to reprise their roles from the first film, and it would involve the British Marines attempting to rescue the Prime Minister and the Queen of England. This idea was eventually scrapped. And as mentioned earlier, in 2005, Danny stated that a sequel was in production, but that he wouldn't be directing it. He had prior commitments to direct his upcoming sci-fi spectacle, Sunshine. However, he would stay on this movie as an executive producer. Danny Boyle teased that the plot would revolve around the aftermath of the first film. It would involve the US Army stating that the war against the infection was won and reconstruction of the country would be commencing. Rowan Yaffe began writing the first draft, which would include a family dealing with restarting after the outbreak. See this look? This is Triple A. Access all areas. That's me. I basically run the place, you know? After impressing Danny Boyle with his film Intacto, Spanish filmmaker Juan Carlos Fresnadillo was hired to direct the film. Danny believed that he would be able to bring something fresh and new to the series. Fresnadillo read Yafe's script and wanted to develop a family aspect and retain some of that in the plot more. So the rewrite took almost a year with Alex Garland adding some input to the script as well. Fox Atomic was the distribution and production house for this film. It was a company that arose in 2006 as a sister company to both 20th Century Fox and Fox Searchlight. They mainly distributed horror and comedy genre films, and eventually the company was shut down in 2009. 28 Weeks Later was going to be their third film in production, after the failures of Teristas and The Hills Have Eyes Part 2. Can you tell me anything about how you managed to keep alive while you were gone so long? Casting began in 2006 and included Robert Carlyle, Rose Byrne, Catherine McCormick, Harold Perrineau, Imogen Poots, Idris Elba, Macintosh Muggleton, and Jeremy Renner. Welcome to London. Unfortunately, this was the only film that Macintosh Muggleton ever starred in. Rose Byrne would be in both this film as well as Danny Boyle's film Sunshine, and they released only a few months apart from each other in the summer of 2007. Here's a fun fact regarding the extras who play the infected in the film. All of the extras hired for this film were required to have a movement-based artistic background, including occupations like ballet, dance, gymnastics, circus performing, and even miming. Kid. Production commenced on September 1st, 2006. The film was shot in London, with much of the filming taking place at Canary Wharf in the Isle of Dogs. 
Some of the production was filmed at Three Mills Studios, where Sunshine was also filming, and some shots towards the end were needed at Wembley Stadium, but because of a major reconstruction there, filming was moved to Wales and Cardiff's Millennium Stadium was used as a replacement. Visual effects were used to turn the seats red and to make the grass look unattended to. The film employed a combination of practical effects, stunts, and computer-generated imagery to depict the infected and the destruction caused to London. The visual effects team created a post-apocalyptic landscape and realistic depictions of the infected population, and the film's cinematography showcased the desolate environment, emphasizing the contrast between a decimated city and isolated safe zones. New arrivals are reminded, for their own safety, it is absolutely forbidden to cross the river and leave the security zone. All of the night scenes involving Imogen, Rose, McIntosh, and Renner's journey across London to escape the bombs were shot day for night using new editing techniques created specifically for this film by the director of photography, Enrique Chediak. By shooting during the daytime, however, there are fewer lights on in most buildings, thus giving the impression of buildings being in total darkness. They were shot like this for three reasons. Firstly, because the filmmakers couldn't use Macintosh at night. Secondly, there's a scene that shows a total shutdown of power in London. And lastly, Juan Carlos Fresnadillo was a fan of the spooky day-for-night shooting and thought it would add a sense of unease to this movie. Which it totally does. I thought I'd lost you too. We won't get separated again. Stay together, whatever happens. 28 weeks later unfolds six months after the outbreak of a rage virus devastated the UK. The film follows the events that occur when the virus resurfaces in a secured safe zone called District 1 in London. As chaos erupts, a small group of survivors, including a man named Don and his children Tammy and Andy. After Don gets infected by the virus, Tammy, Andy, a medical officer named Scarlett, and a sniper named Doyle attempt to escape the city while facing both the infected and a deadly military response led by General Stone. Their journey is fueled by Don's guilt and desire to protect his children, leading to sacrifices and moral dilemmas along the way. Twenty Eight Weeks Later was released on May 11, 2007, opening in second place at the box office as it grossed $9.8 million. Its overall gross was $28.6 million domestically and $35.6 million internationally. This brings the worldwide total to $64.2 million. And critics were kind, giving it a 72% on Rotten Tomatoes, with the consensus being that it's fun, exciting, and action-packed with fantastic atmosphere and punchy direction. And audiences seem to enjoy it as well. This film is packed with excellent scenes. I mean, the intro alone is worth a watch. In it, Don and his wife Alice are hiding out from the infected with a group of survivors. Unfortunately, they're found, and so begins an intense chase scene accompanied by a heart-pounding score composed by John Murphy. Danny Boyle even directed second unit footage for the opening scene. On October 9, 2007, 28 weeks later was released on DVD and Blu-ray. Both copies have the same bonus features and offer some great supplements. If you care about audio commentary and tech specs of a film, then you should definitely give it a listen. Director Juan Carlos Fresnadillo and writer-producer Enrique Lopez Levine offer up some excellent behind-the-scenes knowledge of how they made the film. There's also some great deleted scenes and standard featurettes about the movie as well. And um, Juan Carlos Fresnadillo was a great man to hand the baton on to. Thank you, Danny. The ending shows the infected running towards the Eiffel Tower. You hear someone over the comms saying that the infection has spread outside of England and has been released to continental Europe. And it is such a good ending, and as a fan, I've been waiting ever since 2007 to see a follow-up. In June 2019, Danny Boyle confirmed that he and Alex Garland had met to discuss preparation for a third film. Unfortunately, we haven't heard much since then. And Danny's last film was Yesterday, released in 2019, so with no upcoming films or TV shows confirmed, it's as good a time as any for Danny to go back to the well and make a proper sequel to this perfect series. I absolutely love this film. It's gripping, intense, relentless, and serves as a worthy sequel to its predecessor. The performances all around are commendable, with Robert Carlyle standing out as a great antagonist. Visually, it's beautiful, especially when being compared to how ugly the first one looks. It dives into some thought-provoking themes such as the dark side of human nature and choices made in extreme circumstances. 
And yes, this is a sequel, but listen, it stands out as a distinct self-contained story that expertly balances action, horror, and emotional depth while providing a thrilling cinematic experience. Some will complain and say that certain plot points and character decisions may feel predictable or convenient and dilute the impact of the story. And that's okay. I still very much enjoy this film, and I'm going to give it a solid 8 out of 10. What are you afraid of? What if it comes back? It won't come back. What if it does? If it comes back, we kill it. It's code red. Overall, 28 Weeks Later is a worthy sequel that delivers on the suspense and horror established by its predecessor. It showcases strong performances, relentless pacing, and some visually striking scenes. Set to an eerie score by John Murphy and brilliantly directed by Juan Carlos Fresnadillo, it's sure to satisfy any fan of intense and adrenaline-fueled cinema. Come on. Get in. Come on! <laughs>